Tonight, we welcome you to our virtual Ash Wednesday service. Ash Wednesday emphasizes a dual encounter. We confront our own mortality and confess our sin before God within the community of faith. The form and content of this service focus on the dual themes of sin and death in light of God's redeeming love in Jesus Christ. Know that the mercy and grace of God is available to all who seek him. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all of our sins. God's mercy endures forever. Let us pray. O oh God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made, from the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would rise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. reading from Joel 2, verses 1 and 2, and 12 to 17. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from old from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, 
a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather up the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the people, Where is their God? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading is taken from 2 Corinthians, beginning with the 5th chapter, 20th verse, reading from the New International Version. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
6 verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Good evening, High Street family and friends. It is hard to believe that already it's Ash Wednesday and we are preparing for the Lenten season. Where did the time go? I heard someone just today make a comment that since March of 2020, they felt as though they were in the Lenten season for an entire year. The whole COVID-19 experience has been very surreal, if you think about it. Every time when you thought you had experienced the worst of it, when you thought that the spike in the death rates had climbed the highest, when you heard one of the atrocious stories of loved ones dying in the hospital by themselves, when you thought you had experienced the worst of it, what happened? It only got worse. Even now, as we peer around the corner with the vaccinations in place, we now brace ourselves as we hear of some mutant variations of the COVID-19 virus. What do you do? when there's nothing left. In the time allotted me tonight, won't you join me in pondering the following thought? What do you do when there's nothing left? What do you do when there's nothing left? Let us pray tonight 
This is an opening prayer from the prayer book of the Episcopal Church. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing. You have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Church, what do you do when there's nothing left? Today's text is from one of the shortest books in the Bible, the book of Joel. Our text today is taken from the second of its three chapters. Joel speaks of the blessing that is possible for the children of Israel, but only if they would repent. But let us go back to the first chapter, verse 4. Listen while I read these words. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Clearly, church, that begs the question, what do you do when there's nothing left? Many of us today wonder when things will return to normal, when we can resume and take back our life. As this constant and gnawing thought remains in our head, another still and quiet thought is present. What if this is as good as it gets? Despite what is present before them, Joel encourages the people. He encouraged even us that no matter what the present looks like, no matter what the situation is, no matter how dire the circumstances are, that our hope lies in the, our hope and our future lie in the hands of God. Joel reminds us that we are to repent, that the God we serve is gracious, he is merciful, he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Joel is clear that a change of heart and a commitment to follow God is required. <clears throat> what do you do when there's nothing left? Verse 12 and verse 13 read, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. Church, as we enter this season of Lent, let us find, let each of us find ways that we may return to God. Perhaps we might read and meditate on his word daily. Maybe we start our day with prayer and end with the same. Perhaps there'll be some of us that decide to sacrifice or set aside something or some sort of fast, if you will. Let us go before God and seek him in ways that will draw us closer. Most of us, if we're honest, we've all tried to do it our way. We've exhausted and, and run through a whole gamut of various things. Maybe, church, 
may be a closer and committed walk with God is what we do when there's nothing left. This is God's word for God's people. Amen. Hear now our invitation to the observance and Lenten discipline. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During the season, converts of the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and it separated themselves from the community of faith, were reconciled by penance and forgiveness, and restored to the participation in the early life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe the Holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now bow before our Creator and Redeemer. Tonight I pray on behalf of our congregation. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me here with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. May the almighty and merciful God, who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live, accept your repentance and forgive your sins and restore you by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. Won't you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 